A couple are driven from their home in 1995 after a series of terrifying paranormal incidents. Could it all really have been caused by a simple visit to a theater show led by a psychic medium? We will ask, did a spirit follow them home? A freaky and little known paranormal case from Rye Hope in England. There's a coastal village in the northeast of England called Rye Hope. It's just on the boundary of Sunderland with a population of about 14,000. But the frightful paranormal experience that we're going to talk about tonight happened to just, just some of them, just a family. It began in 1995 when I was living nine miles away from Rye Hope. I grew up in the Northeast. These frightening events were recorded by Daniel Ritson in his book Poltergeists, Parallels and Contagion, and it was also featured at the time in Michael J. Hallowell's column in the Shields Gazette newspaper. The story centered on a couple who Ritson calls Arnold and Frieda Longthorne, though these are false names to protect their identity. Life was great for the Longthorns. They were living in a converted farmhouse not far from the beach that looked out onto the North Sea. The local community in Ryhope Village was friendly. They had good friends there. All seemed well. Until the afternoon when the phone in the house began to ring. Frida picked it up and it was her friend who told her that she was going to attend a show that night and she wondered if Frida would like to join her. Maybe Frida thought it was going to be some play or a musical or something, but no, it turned out her friend wanted to go and see a famous celebrity medium who was performing in the area that night. Now, at first, Frida wasn't really interested in doing this. She wasn't into this type of thing. Frankly, she was quite happy to stay at home watching television. But the more that her friend seemed to push for it, she was clearly needing a companion. She eventually said, go, go on then, I'll join you and I'll go with you. Frida had no idea how much she would come to regret that decision. So Frida was now going out for the night, so she headed upstairs, got showered and dressed and ready for the show. And she headed out only a few miles away to get to the Sunderland Theatre. She met her friend and headed inside. And this is what Frida said of that evening event. To be quite honest, I was bored. I just sat at the back and really heard nothing that interested me. Afterwards, I just drove home and thought nothing more about it. Arnold a servant police officer, and I just had something to eat, watched some TV, and then went to bed. He never even asked what the show had been like. I don't think he was interested either, to be frank. And so, not particularly impressed, Frida settled into bed and fell asleep. She had no idea that something had changed in the house. Frida was having breakfast with Arnold the next morning, and Arnold had uh, sadly died, by the way, since this happened. But on that morning, he was alive and well, and he finally seemed to take some interest in her outing last night. They're sitting there eating breakfast, and he started to ask her about it. And he was he basically asked her, was it, was it successful? Was it a successful display of a medium show? Frida shrugged, saying she didn't think there was much to it. But it was about then that she noticed Arnold's face. He didn't quite seem himself. He looked troubled. Now, his job was a police officer, so he wasn't easily spooked, but what he said next gave her pause. He said, well, I hope you're right about last night because, because I'm starting to wonder if you might have brought something home with you. Now, she stared at him, like, confused. Like, what do you mean brought something home? Has something happened? Something had. Last night, they'd both gone to bed and drifted off to sleep as usual. But then Arnold said that at about 2 a.m., he found himself completely awake. He had no idea what had woken him. But as he was sitting there in the bed and his eyes adjusted to the dark room, he saw something totally unexpected. In the corner of the room, he said he saw a small green light, which was growing and glowing and hovering. This is not the type of thing you expect to see when you wake up. So he just stared at this in shock, trying to compute what on earth it could be. 
but it really was starting to expand. It got bigger and bigger and bigger again until it was about the size of a football. Now that that light was larger, Arnold could see that some parts of the light were darker than others. It was as if, well, as if there was a shape inside the light that you couldn't really make out, but there was a shape in there nonetheless. He didn't have time to examine it though, because suddenly the glowing light just kind of winked out and disappeared, plunging the room back into darkness. He sat there for a moment, trying to get his head around what he had seen, and was about to turn over in bed to try and get some sleep when all of a sudden, the alarm clock, which sat on a chest of drawers beside the bed, just suddenly burst into loud life. The room was filled with the piercing shriek of an electric alarm. But that was not really what chilled him. What made him feel suddenly cold inside was that he said he could hear the sound of his daughter who had a disability. His daughter was crying out, Daddy! Only the voice was coming from inside the clock. I know that sounds crazy, but it was coming from inside the clock. And weirdly, Frida, as far as I know, was not woken by this. So confused and frightened, Arnold just pressed his head into the pillow and eventually tried to get to sleep. But of course, sleep didn't come so easily. So Frida just sat across the um, breakfast table to him, hearing this story, and all she could say in response to this was, look, you've obviously had a crazy and freaky dream. He considered this, but he decided not to dwell on it any longer. And they finished up their breakfast and they just headed on with their day. And if it had ended there, you know, maybe it really could have been filed under the imagination. But that night, at the same time, it happened again. The clock turned silently to 2 a.m. And once again, Arnold flicked his eyes open into the dark bedroom. Next to him, he saw Frida was sleeping. But then he brought himself to look into the corner again where the light was last night. And sure enough, there it was again. The green light hovering once more. And just like last night, it was starting to grow. He stared at this green light just as he had before. And he could see the darker shapes within it, only this time they were becoming clearer. A shape was starting to appear, but before he could tell what it was, the light had faded once again. The alarm, as far as I know, didn't happen again. Now, the next morning, Arnold couldn't stop himself. He had to tell Frieda of this eerie light that it had returned, and she listened, and she could see how shaken he was by this. And she wasn't ready to dismiss this as a dream this time. And she started to wonder too, what happens if I could I like picked up some, I don't know, like supernatural hitchhiker at the medium show the other night. The idea of this actually started to get its claws into her. In her mind, as the minutes and the hours passed of the day, she started to become increasingly frightened and felt oppressed. And it was with some trepidation that both of them went to bed that night, the third night. And just like the two previous nights, Arnold found himself wide awake at 2 a.m. And once again, the glowing light appeared only this time. The shape within the glow was becoming more distinct than ever. Arnold leaned in and stared at this growing image. And he started to see that it was taking on an unmistakable shape. He gasped in shock because floating in the green glowing light was a human face. Then like before it vanished. Part of him didn't want to tell her, but she was becoming clearly frightened by this and he felt he had to be straight with her. So the next day he told her about the emerging face. Sure enough, she was terrified. So much so that she seemed to have started losing her appetite around then. The fourth night rolled around and the light returned and the shape within it was so clear this time that Arnold could tell it was the face of a woman, an elderly woman, and she was glaring intently at Arnold. Now, Arnold was frightened enough, he would happily admit that, but then something happened next that chilled him to the bone. This circle of light started to change shape. An opening at the bottom of the circle turned the glowing orb into something like a bell shape, which is when it struck him. That wasn't a bell. Those were shoulders forming underneath the face. 
He said he felt his stomach churn with a kind of disgusted horror, with the impression that clearly whatever this thing was, was getting more and more evident and clearer with every passing night, which meant, does that mean at some point it would fully materialize and he would see what this woman, who this woman was? Did he even want to know? And this gave him a sense of impending doom. They had no idea who to turn to in this situation. And so they just went to, bre to bed dreading what might happen. But to their surprise, the next night, nothing happened. And Arnold opened his eyes to the bright sun of the morning. Maybe they thought the strange paranormal events were over, but actually the terrifying presence was only getting started. Well, as the days went on, um, Frida started to calm down a bit. I mean, she still was struggling with appetite and she had this sense of dread and she was actually starting to lose weight. So much was the stress of all of this. But, you know, they had another night when actually things were not too bad. They went to bed about 11.30 p.m., for example. They woke up the next morning. Everything looked great. They were looking at the bright sun in the morning. And though Arnold said, look, I didn't, I didn't see any glowing light last night. But then he just, he said this, he said, but I did have an extremely strange dream. He said, you're not going to believe this, but I actually dreamt. <laughs> I dreamt that I was wandering around on all fours in the back garden and I was eating the grass of the lawn. How weird is that? Well, it was very weird indeed. And both of them laughed it off and tried to forget about the dream. But how could he forget when he pulled back the covers and swung his legs over to the side of the bed? And that's when Frida noticed his fingers clutching at the sheet to pull it back. She gasped in shock because his fingernails were black and ingrained inside them was mud and soil and bits of grass. And as they looked closer, they could see that his hands were covered in these scratches. They looked at each other with horror. He just dreamt that he had been crawling on all fours in the garden eating grass, but was that even a dream. Panicked, Arnold sprang out of bed and Frida followed and they scrambled downstairs so they could, you know, check all the doors of the house. If he had gone out last night, even in his sleep, you know, sleepwalking, then, you know, they'd probably be lying open or maybe the keys would be like lying around or something, but they weren't. They were all shut. Everything was locked. And when they checked the security alarm, they confirmed that it, had, it hadn't been activated. Well, sorry, it was on during the night, I should say, but it hadn't gone off. They checked the floors of the house, looking for traces of mud and dirty footprints. They saw nothing. This made absolutely no sense. So the only explanation they could think of was, well, he must have been sleepwalking somehow. Yet they could find no trace of anybody dragging any garden dirt into the house last night. It seemed like Arnold had never left the bed, but they could not deny the scratched skin and the dirty fingers that was telling a different story. So things were really getting scary now. So Arnold hurried to get all of that crap from the garden cleaned off and imagine their shock when they woke the next morning and his hands were caked with dirt again. Only this time, the scratches were running up his arms and they were deep ones at that. If Arnold was about to suggest that he must have been sleepwalking, then Frida put him right. She said that she was becoming so shaken by this ordeal that she hadn't slept a wink last night and so she sat there, in bed, and she would swear that he never left the bed despite his hands and arms screaming otherwise. Frida was, quite frankly, a mess at this point. She still wasn't eating properly and was starting to become weak and pale and visibly thinner. So much so that the neighbours were starting to worry that she had some sort of illness. This was out and it was just getting too much. So when Arnold had gone in for his police station shift that day, Frida went to visit her friend, Michael and Jackie. Michael's the one who wrote up the case in the Shields Gazette. And when they both saw Frida, they were instantly concerned that there was something seriously wrong. But when she told him the nature of their problem and all their details, well, they were shocked. Whatever they were, though, was not suspicious. They could see that their friend, who they loved and trusted, was terrified. It's easy for us, isn't it, to dismiss these stories because we don't know the people. But the people who know the people know that you're obviously you're not making this up. 
and she said she would never return back to that house again. And sure enough, she had her whole family move out of the farmhouse in Ryehope that day, and they moved in with Arnold's brother, who lived in Darlington, that's about 30 miles south. And even though her and Arnold stayed away from the house, they were still keen to figure out what could have happened back there. And so Frida would chat to Michael on the phone. He would quiz her for details of anything unusual about the house. And at one point, she did remember um, a detail. She said, well, look, there were two brothers who lived in a cottage just was adjacent to this farmhouse. And she did know that these two boys had been dabbling in the occult and... uh, the boys had a particular fascination with using the Ouija board. I used to play, uh, use the Ouija board quite a lot when I was a teenager too. And she said that the boy's former bedroom directly looked onto the bedroom in which she had slept with Arnold, where all of this high strangeness had occurred. They started to wonder, could, could it be the hats? Is it the boys? Did they unleash something kind of supernatural when they used these things? Or was it latent in their house until it kind of got unlocked? by visiting the medium in the theater show. All of this was just obviously speculation, but it still was totally baffling and intriguing. Well, the weeks went by and Frida and Arnold and the family were um, still staying in the brother's house. But after a while, Frida started speaking to Michael's wife, Jackie. And she said that, look, one option would be for you guys to just go back to the farmhouse, but go back with a completely different attitude. Flood that place with a sense of hopefulness and of ownership. It is your house. And Jackie suggested that they redecorate. Perhaps the house needed a makeover. Makeovers were quite big around the mid-90s on TV. Now, Frida considered this idea and started to think, you know what? Yeah, I'm going to go back and I'm going to put my stamp on the place. She says, "I'm, I'm too scared to go and paint on my own. And so Jackie offered straight away, look, I'll go down. I'll help you with the paint job and to keep you company. And several days passed while they got the materials together. And then finally, they both headed back to this mysterious farmhouse in Ryehope. They reached the front door. And after a deep breath, Frida went inside. And to her delight, she felt nervous, but okay. And in time, the two women set about painting. And while they did it, there wasn't a single incident of poltergeist or haunting type activity at all and as they painted they discussed the change and Frida was becoming convinced that somehow Jackie's positive hopeful attitude was changing the atmosphere the painting went so well that Frida and Arnold decided to move back into the house and they did and to their surprise their pleasant surprise no more paranormal incidents happened in the house from then on So what the heck was going on with this peculiar and freaky case from 1995? Well, the worry about sleepwalking is not uncommon, though when it comes to poltergeist cases, you know, you do see it come up sometimes. An example uh, from someone on an online forum, the Quora forum, um, was saying once that they slept uh, in, in bed and then they would wake up and find all of their pillows off the bed and piled carefully into a stack in the middle of the floor. Was that a poltergeist or did they just do it? I also found another um, person on Reddit who said that when they were young, this is quite strange, when they were young, they would often wake up in the middle of the night with their pajamas, which they put on before they went to sleep, their pajamas backwards. Perplexed and disturbed by this, the poster said that they tried an experiment one night. They tried to lie in bed and try to turn the clothes manually to try and, you know, do that. And they said they struggled to do it. They had to get out of bed to do it. And they thought, well, you know, how, how come I didn't wake up? Was I sleepwalking or not? So baffled by this idea, the sufferer asked to sleep with her parents for company and she slept in between her parents. She thought, oh, well, it's going to be obvious if I sleepwalk then. The next morning she woke up her clothes were on backwards. You might think, well, surely the kid might have just got out of bed and got changed. But no, the parents were adamant. You did you didn't move. You were in bed the whole night. We would have known if you'd clambered or crawled over us. Well, the poster admitted that years went by and they would start to just sleep in their pants, right? Um, without pajamas. But then they started waking up wearing basketball shorts that they had no memory of putting on. And then in more recent years, the poster said that they were starting to find themselves waking up 
sitting on the bed staring at the closet, so maybe it was sleepwalking. But how does that explain the parents not noticing? So it's all a bundle of confusion, this, this sleepwalking angle. Who, who knows? But what about this Ryhope case in which the paranormal activity started after a visit to a psychic medium show? Well, some might dismiss that as pure coincidence. Others would strongly argue a direct causal link. For example, I was doing a debate on a radio station the other day um, with an ex-psychic who became a born-again Christian, and she was adamant in this debate. Um, I was kind of on the opposing side on some of, many of her arguments, and at this point, she was adamant that connecting with such forces opens up a dangerous doorway to supernatural activity. So is that what happened here? Or does such a view condemn an entire group of people, i.e. You know, I, spiritualists and psychic mediums? Besides, some people actively want to experience the supernatural, so maybe that's a desirable thing for some, I don't know. I'm open-minded on this, but I would say that I did find a more recent case where a family claimed to have had a haunting in their home after visiting a clairvoyant. It happened in January of 2023. Gillian Harper, who's aged uh, 25, or was then, and Kieran Ruse, aged 27, were living in their home in the city of Hull in the north of England. Gillian is a senior care assistant and Kieran is a pig farmer. They had no paranormal issues in their home for the two years up to this incident. I went to Hull once, by the way, on a werewolf hunt, which I talk about in my book, The Frighteners, Why We Love Monsters, Ghosts, Death and Gore, a little bit of a plug there. But Gillian and Kieran were not hunting for werewolves, but they did want to encounter the supernatural because they decided to visit a psychic medium. And they came back from this visit to a house like I say, they've lived in there for two years without any paranormal activity, but then a few days after they had this visit with the medium, they started to hear a strange banging sound, a knocking sound that came from the lounge, the, the living room. They were very perplexed by this, uh, but just wrote it off as one of those things, because houses can make funny noises sometimes. Central heating systems and pipes can rattle and click. Maybe it was just that. But as a few weeks went on, you know, Kieran was not happy with this and neither was Gillian. But, but one day, Kieran spotted their family cat acting strangely. It was sitting at the bottom of the stairs, just glaring across at the hall. No big deal, right? But enough to make him worried that there might be something wrong with the animals. So he went over to check and he's like, you know, hey, hey, you okay? You okay? And at the precise moment, he heard the knocking pounding from the lounge again. It was clear and distinct. Freaked out, he texted Gillian, and later on they started a, a more thorough search of the room together, trying to work out where the noise came from, trying to track down the source. You might think that sounds easier than you think, but actually, it's sometimes it's hard to locate lower frequency sounds. It's one of the reasons why in home cinema setups, you can place the satellite speakers that have higher frequencies anywhere in the room, well, sorry, in certain points in the room, but you can put the subwoofer, which creates bass, anywhere you like in the room because it doesn't matter because your ear can't locate where the bass is coming from very easily. So it took them a while, but eventually they narrowed this ominous rapping sound down to the wooden floorboards, or rather, underneath the floorboards. It was like something was knocking up at them from under the house. They placed their hands on the wood and snapped them back because they could feel the vibrations of the knocks in their fingertips. There's somebody living in our f***ing floorboards. Listen. It's like it's not on the other side, there's like a few. It's like is un it? underneath. They might have a basement next door, will they? <laughs> Don't move, Freddy. Really. <laughs> it's right there. This knocking would be regular and it would happen at the same time each night, around 9 p.m. And it would last for about an hour. Both of them were scared and especially the children were scared too. It got worse when the knocking began to come at other times. 
For example, at 1 p.m. in the afternoon, once uh, Jillian and the daughter were in the house and felt safe because it didn't normally happen until nighttime, and then all of a sudden the banging started at 1. If you can hear me, knock two times. The baby daughter started to talk to something in the front room that wasn't there, saying, Hiya! An imaginary friend? Well, maybe. But the daughter never did anything like that or interacted with anything invisible other than in the front room. And what about the knocking? Well, Kieran said this. He said, <laughs> It's so creepy. It's vibrating it's, the floor. It's not like it's on the other side of the wood. It feels like it's maybe half a foot underneath and they're tapping something that's like if there was a brick underneath they're tapping the brick it was a strong one he felt the link was indeed to the visit to the clairvoyant who told him that she could see Kieran's grandfather with him the whole time they were keen to pull up the floorboards by the way in case you're wondering Uh, But their house was rented and the landlord refused to let them do it. And they couldn't afford to move either. So they just said, this is something we have to live with and deal with. And that's what they did. So what was going on in this peculiar paranormal case from Ryhope? Or indeed, even the one from Hull? Were both cases linked to the psychic medium encounters? Or is that just a really simplistic way of looking at it? Some would say the case in Hull might be a hoax designed for the TikTok generation. I don't know, maybe. But the case in Ryhope happened in 1995 and was looked into by a credible paranormal investigator who who couldn't quite work out how a man could sleep soundly next to his wife in a locked house and dream of crawling on all fours in the garden eating grass only to wake up with soil under his fingernails. Have you ever thought about what you do at night when you sleep? Do you assume you do nothing? How do you know? Have you ever filmed yourself? And if you did film yourself, what might you see? Glowing and growing next to you in your bed, guiding you to do things you would never dream of doing? I'm Peter Laws and you've been listening to Did a Spirit Follow Them Home? A freaky, little known paranormal case from Ryhope, England. It was sitting at the bottom of the stairs, just glaring across at the hall. No big deal, right? But enough to make him worried. It was sitting at the bottom of the stairs, just glaring across at the hall. No big stairs, just glaring across at the hall. Hall, hall, hall.